Jay Leno, what a pleasure to have you on Cars and Culture. Welcome to the program. Thanks. Appreciate it. Wonderful to talk to you again. And uh, first off, congratulations on being inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame. The ceremony takes place tonight. Uh, should have taken place last year. Right, right. Um, so I, I got I'm, so many protests because I was nominated that they had to postpone it. No, well, no, I, the COVID, <laughs> I think is what it was. Yeah. I, th I thought they, they, they perhaps also had you. Well, you've been wearing the tux for the last two and a half years, right? That's right. So it's, uh, you know, can't, can't wait to take this thing off. <laughs> You know, it's your second appearance in a Hall of Fame, as you know, um, about seven years ago or so, you were inducted into the Television Hall of Fame. What does the Automotive Hall of Fame mean to you, Jay? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of cool because when you're in TV, you know, it's like uh, the, the network will say, we're going to nominate you for Emmy and then we'll be uh, sort of pushing it on various websites, we'll be contact. So it, it's one of those things you it's part of the business and people try to get it. You sort of run for it almost, you know? I mean, some people do, some people don't, but to a certain extent, you're kind of doing it. This just came out of the blue. It's like, oh, well, thank you. I mean, somebody uh, thought maybe this might be a good idea, probably because of Jay Leno's Garage, because we feature so many different kinds, not just Lamborghinis and supercars and things like that. It's just all types of transportation from steam wagons to yeah. the gas turbine to guys. So it's more the history of transportation and, and the engineers and the men and women behind it. So I think it probably has more to do with that than anything else. Well, yeah. I mean, you certainly didn't run for it. Um, I know, right. I know you're, a, you're a student of automotive history hugely, but what was your reaction? I mean, when the phone call came in. What, well, I was, I was, I was uh, really honored by it. I thought, oh, well, that's pretty cool because, I, you know, to, to me, just coming from New England, there is a certain, you know, a guy who runs is better than a guy who walks. A guy who walks is better than he drives. And the guy who works with his hands is better than the guy who just sits and types at a computer all day. I mean, he probably doesn't get paid as much, but there's something more real about it. And to me, as a kid, I always admired men, and to a certain extent, women too, who could fix things with their hands and work with their hands. I mean, that was always, uh, I always believe the heart is healthiest when the head and the hands work together, if that makes any sense at all. Uh, you know, I, I tell jokes during the day, at night rather, and then during the day, I like to come to the garage and work on stuff. Because when you work on things, it gives you a perspective of how how hard it is to make money. When you only get paid 80 bucks to take a transmission out, and your hands are all cut and you're covered with grease and smell like transmission oil. It's like, oh, that's a, that's a hard 80 bucks to earn as opposed to just standing on the stage and talking and people throw dollars at you, which is it's just excellent too. Please don't, uh, don't get me wrong. I love that. But it does make you appreciate it, you know? Uh, when I, you know, I always hear friends of show business say, I got off at this, I'm not going there for this kind of money. I go, what are you doing on a Tuesday that's right. worth that kind of money? Okay. Right. I mean, right. you, you have to look at things from a normal perspective. And comedy is only funny when it comes from an everyman point of view. So when you work with your hands and you do mechanical things, you just appreciate the everyman point of view, you know? Did you know much like, about the uh, Hall of Fame? Did you know much about the automotive? Hall? I mean, obviously from you know Henry Ford to the, to the you know the PX. Well, I know most of the names on it. I know why they're there. I, I can't say I know history of the actual who formed it, and I assumed it was formed for the obvious reasons. Uh, but you know the big players. You know all yeah. the big players. Yeah, they, which which is exciting and kind of fun, and I like uh, the obscure ones are interesting to me as well too. You know, going back to the. You know, that's the fun thing about this hobby. If, you, if you're studying the pyramids, well, everything is 5,000 years old, and the chances of you finding any actual artifacts of piece of history are, are pretty slim, unless you have just ways and means beyond the average person. But the automobile is really, the history is really no more than maybe 150 years old, and that's probably stretching as well. I mean, it really starts from the early 1900s. So when you go to King's Bookstore in downtown Detroit, and you oh my, here's a book for five dollars written in 1906 on the history of the automobile. You go, oh, this is pretty cool, you know. So that's what I like about it. The history is not that old, you know, and you can learn a lot about it. You know, when uh, Dr. Joyce Brothers, uh, she got famous because she was on the sixty-four thousand dollar question. That was a quiz show that was popular mm -hmm. back in the day. And you had to have a topic. So she picked boxing, even though she knew nothing about boxing, but she knew it was only from about Jack Johnson to now. 
and you only had to memorize about a hundred names. And so she studied all those and she won the $64,000 question. You know, and that's what's kind of fun about it. It all sort of takes place, at least for America, in and around Detroit, Indianapolis. And you can actually walk down the same streets that Henry Ford drove down and see a lot of the same factories, a lot of the same buildings that have been converted. I mean, Connors Avenue just is, is gone now, I guess, with the Packard right. factory. Was. But Woodward Avenue is still there. And there, you know, there's still the old guys who are now my age can tell you about racing on, with GTOs and Corvette. And, and so it, it's Woodward just- Woodward Avenue, right. Uh, it's a fun, you know, I, I find when you first get interested in cars, you like the fast cars of today. And then you go, what came before this? Well, it was a muscle car of the 60s. What came before that? Well, it was the the big, powerful muscle cars of the 50s, the Chrysler 300s with 392 Hemi and all that. What came before that? Well, then that Buick Straight 8 with the overhead valves. And then before that, you had steam and electric. And so it, it's fun to keep going back and see what came before whatever it is you like. So related to history, let's continue with a personal story. Several years ago, when you were working closely with General Motors Parts and Service, I had the chance to tour the garage that you're sitting in right now in Burbank, located in an anonymous space right behind the airport. They said, well, you're going to go see Jay's Garage. And I thought, wow, there's going to be flashing lights and there may even be a band outside that's going to play before I walk in, just, uh, you know, the way that the band used to play for you. Uh, yeah, white exterior, no signs, no flashing lights, but a world of wonder inside, row after row, Jay. We of took cars. down the flat. We knew you were coming, so we thought we could hide by taking away the band, the flashing lights. We saw you drive by a couple of times. Then, then you figured out we we're going. God damn up. All right, I'll have them come in. So, but the flashing lights and the band, they're out there now. But yeah, yeah. Well, they're now. Okay, so I'll be right over. Yeah. But I mean, nearly 200 cars, about 160 bikes, one of the largest collections in the world. You've got memorabilia. You have engines. You have T-shirts. You have hand-painted artwork of posters. I know it's one of the biggest in the world, but it, it's just, it, it, it's rather eclectic. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It's anything that rolls and explodes and makes noise. <laughs> you know, I, I, I never really get one make collections where guys just have 64 to 66 Mustang, and that's all they have. And I mean, to me, the, the fun part is seeing the difference between, you know, all, all automobiles now have a sameness to them. They got park, R, D, N, D, neutral, low. You know, whereas in the old days, you had the push button transmissions, you had just all kinds of oddball semi clutch things. I mean, record I've got players in the center consoles. I could play, I've got a, I've got a Nash uh, here, mm -hmm. an air flight, and you stop it by taking the shifter and pulling it towards three on the tree and pulling it towards you. And that's how you start the car. But anybody trying to steal us would have no idea how to, how to start this car, you know? So that sort of makes it fun. Yeah. Every, every car that you took me around, Jay, you knew every story, you knew the engine, you knew the owner, the history, the significance, chassis, gearbox, horsepower. Some say that you, you know more about cars than most historians. I want to know where that passion came from. Well, I don't know if that, I don't know if that's true. I mean, I, you know what you know. It, it's what I it's what I enjoy, and I enjoy reading the history of the automobile. Um, but you're rural Boston, right? And and you're and you're growing up. Were you, were you into cars as a kid? Yeah, I lived in a rural area about 20 miles south of the New Hampshire border. So, you know, it was different back then. Boys are expected to know how to fix lawnmowers and snowmobiles and go karts and that type of thing. You know, you could. I remember when we were. 11, we found a uh, Renault for CV and we had three and a half acres behind our house and we fixed up this car and we'd, we'd drive around the backyard and, you know, my mom would watch from the, the window, you know, you know, she's doing dishes or something. She just watches and we just drive around in circles and do stuff boys do with, with an old car. I mean, now, of course, uh, the car would be taken away. My parents would be arrested. Arrested. I'd be in foster care because they <laughs> to drive a car but, but but back then it was just a little bit different you know it was uh you know here's how different it was i think the high school had a gun club <laughs> oh <laughs> you could bring your bb gun or a 22 and put it in a locker and afterwards they, okay those days that's just fire a few rounds in the back happen. yeah that's never going to happen again but you know it was just different the whole mindset of everything was just was just different. I mean, my mother knew nothing about cars, but she knew when her Valiant didn't start to open the hood, take off the round thing, stick a screwdriver down the skinnier round thing to keep that flap open. 
and then try to crank, you know, nowadays cars are pretty bulletproof. So nobody really needs to know anything other than just how to start it. You know? Was your dad a car guy? My dad was a mechanic guy, but not a car guy. My dad was, uh, you know, uh, uh, get a stick shift, get an automatic. Why would you want to shift? Cause my dad grew up in an era when there was no synchromesh. And my dad was born in 1910. So shifting was a laborious chore. And when he got a car with an automatic, oh my God, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. You know, my dad just thought that was the greatest thing ever. And of course to my dad paying, every time I looked at an old car, my dad would go, you can buy a new car for that. What? What, why would you pay more for an old? I mean, to him, they were just old cars. You know, to me, it was history. But to my dad, he never, he never, never really got it. No, no. But you start your one of your first jobs was at a car dealership. I did. I worked at Wilmington, Florida, and Wilmington, Massachusetts. I was in charge of odometer recalibrations. That was my area. Oh, and, that's not turning back the odometer before you sell it, is it? Yes, that'd be exactly. <laughs> what, well, actually, a car would come in with ninety six thousand miles. We would do the corrected mileage twenty seven five. <laughs> Have you ever seen a Ferrari with more than twenty seven thousand five hundred miles on it? No. It's a Every good point. One, it just makes me laugh. Every single one. Yeah, I looked at one the other day and it was a 73 and I looked back at one of those Ferrari books and the same car was listed with 27,005. So it just makes me laugh. Yeah. <laughs> but the dealership experience, you said, uh, yeah, you know, you realize you couldn't really afford any of the cars by working there. It wasn't right. going to be, but, but you, but you were a mechanic at heart. I mean, you, you, you weren't well, an I, engineer. You know what I did? I did new car prep. I was mostly. Okay. Polishing, cleaning, putting on license plates, maybe doing occasional oil change. So I was a kid in high school. So it was just fun working there and being around, being in that automotive environment. You know, I remember when I worked at Wilmington Ford, uh, it, we, it was one of those acres of cars places in the back. And my job every night after work was to go out with a big screwdriver and take off all the hubcaps because kids would steal them because, you know, mm -hmm. they'd be. And then next morning, you have to go with a rubber hammer and put them all back on again. And one night at about five o'clock, I was carrying a bunch of hubcaps. I had them all, you know, like two, I carried more hubcaps than I should have. And he came around the corner and bumped into the used car, car manager named Carl. And hubcaps went everywhere. He goes, you can't treat up right. You're fired. I go, well, you bumped into me. I was like, and he fired me. I was so ashamed that I got fired. I never told my parents. I pretended to go to work every day. But I wrote a letter to Henry Ford, and I got a list of the board of directors. It wrote to meet your letter. You know, my dad's got a Galaxy. My mom's got a Falcon. I'm saving for a Mustang. I got fired unfairly. You know, my, my career with Ford Motor Company has been cut short. For some of you, I didn't do blah, blah, blah. So two weeks later, Ben Restucia, the owner of the, uh, of the uh, dealership, called me at home. He said, look, I don't know who you know in Detroit, but if you want your job back, come on back. Oh, okay, great. So wow. I never told my parents that story until years later, but <laughs> it, it, it was just funny. So then I, I felt a certain kinship with at that point. Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a heck of a story. They wrote well, a letter Hank to Henry Ford. Hank the Deuce gave me my job back. Hank the Deuce. Exactly right. You bought your first car at, at 14, right? The 34 Ford uh, pickup V8. So you stayed loyal to the brand. Yeah, I stayed loyal to the brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's funny. You know, that really does work, you know, that brand loyalty. I was at a car show and I met a 16 year old kid named Jack and he bought a six cylinder Mustang when he was 15 and a half. It's just getting his license and he got it running and got it all cleaned up and he brought it to the, to the show. And uh, I was so impressed with him. Uh, I, I invited him on the Jay Lowe's garage show, you know, to show his Mustang, you know, when, oh, he heard from the president of the Ford and they called him and because they saw here's a young guy interested in Mustangs, you know, and, you know, they wrote, well, I hope someday you buy a new Mustang, you know, that kind of stuff. And he got invited to Mustang club events and went, and that's how you get young people interested in the hobby, you know. Uh, you know, we started something. We, we do a concour in Rhode Island at the Audrain Auto Museum. And we started a class a couple of years ago called 30 Under 30, which means people 30 years old or younger that have restored a car for less than $30,000. And we found a bunch of kids, kids, you know, young men and women who did this. And we invited them to the Concord. And these kids were so thrilled to have their 2002 on the same field as Bugatti Chirons and Duesenbergs and exotic Ferraris. And, and you know, they were, they were in suits and ties. And they were so proud that they won and their parents were thrilled. And, you know, now your parents don't have to cry. Do you want to be a mechanic anymore, you know? Uh, because you have places like the Heritage Centers and uh, McPherson College where they give out scholarships. We have a scholarship there, uh, the, the Fred Duesenberg Scholarship. 
for kids that want to go into automobile restoration. And luckily, we've reached the point where automobiles are seen as rolling sculpture. They're kinetic artwork. And they're restored the same way you'd restore the old masters. You know, the old days, you get a belt sander, you just take off the paint, you paint it. But now, we try to preserve as much of the original finish as you can, keep, keep that barn find, which is my favorite expression, barn find. Uh, you know, I, I did some research, and the average farmer makes 42500 a year. How they have birdcage Maseratis and, <laughs> right. uh, in their barns, you know, covered with eggshells. and Million-dollar vehicles hiding under the straw. Yeah, yeah. How, how, how is that possible? That's like my favorite thing. Oh, a barn find in the middle of Kansas. Really? You ever had, you ever had a good barn find? Actually, I have had a good farm, barn find. There you go. <laughs> I got one just the other day. Actually. What'd I you get? Called. A guy called me and he said, uh, oh, my dad bought this car in 1959. It's an Austin Healey Sprite. He said, and we parked in the garage in 73. And he's, uh, he, he's not gone now, but he's not, not well. And Would you like this car? And I went, oh, well, sure. And I went up to look at it and it's like the perfect barn find. It's a 59 Sprite, 100% original. Uh, you know, a few little dings and covered with dirt, but we put it, it turns over, you put a battery, you crank it, I haven't started, just, oh, okay. I mean, it's all there, uh, you know, we'll pull the tank and maybe put a new gas tank in and that's probably. You bought it off him? No, the guy gave it to me. Oh, he gave it to you. Mm. He just wanted to go to a good home because it had been wow. his dad. So. Wow. So, so we just started working on that now. Yeah. Do, do people call you, this is an intriguing question. Do you get calls on a regular basis from folks around the country saying, you know, hey, I'd like to sell you my car or will you come look at my car or can I give I'll, you my car? I'll tell you my favorite one. A lady calls me and she, she's from Massachusetts. She said, um, my husband and I bought a Ferrari in 72 and he just passed away. And I want to sell it. And uh, I said, what do you want for it? She, want, she said, I want uh, $350,000. I know it's a lot of money, but I think it's worth it. And I said, what is it? She said, it's a Ferrari 275 alloy body. Mm. Uh, uh, I think it was twin cam, not a four cam. And I went, oh. I said, well, look, I'll give you 350 for it. But I said, do you, do you know how to cook? Can you bake cookies? She says, yes. I said, okay, if I can get you close to 4 million for that car, will you bake me some cookies? And she said, why? It's not worth that much. I go, it's worth that much. You can sell it with the 350 you want, but I don't want to take your car. It's really worth close. She got three seven five for it, three million seven five, and wow. I got my, I got my. Cookies. And did you get your cookies? I did, I did, and, and she became a friend. And you know, it's nice. I mean, because I get enough free stuff like that Sprite. That's very nice. You don't need to start screwing people over. I don't like it when I hear people tell me a story how they screwed some old guy out of a car. I, I hate those kind of stories. I, I like these kind of stories. And I hear this lady, you know, her husband died, and, they, and he was just a guy. He wasn't a wealthy guy, but, you know, in 1972, you could buy a Ferrari for $5,000, you know, when a Cadillac was $5,000. A uh, Ferrari was still just an old car at that point. Exotic and expensive for the day, but it was that old. And, yeah, and she got, she, I mean, she could not believe it went for that. She was, like, so stunned because she didn't pay attention. She just knew, oh, I, it must be worth at least that. And she just picked a number, you know, so... That was kind of fun. That was kind of fun. We're both dinged at the same time there, Jay. Well, so it what an interesting position for you to be in. You know, you've you've become this kind of conduit uh, to some extent. Uh, well, you know what I hear from the most? I hear from widows who just don't know what to do. Yeah. Because, you know, most car guys are kind of quiet. and They, they don't have any wives, girlfriends don't have any idea. So... Yeah, I try to give them advice, contact the club, uh, it, it, you get Hemmings. What's Hemmings? That's a magazine that has cars. Find a car like your husband, see what they're going for. And, and, and that, that's been pretty successful. But I hear from an awful lot of people like that. Yeah, that seems that, that's a very sad story. You know, half-finished uh, Cobra replicas are very big and all kinds of things like that. When you moved across the country and you, you found your first car in California, you found it the Penny Saver. Three hundred fifty dollars, right? Right, my fifty-five Buick Roadmaster. Yeah, and you lived in the car. You took your wife out in the car. You, yeah, yeah. you hung out in the car. Um, 
when did the collection start to build? Well, I never thought of it as a collection. I just never sold anything. You know, I just sort okay. of, uh, I guess, I mean, I guess it is a collection now, but they're all registered. They're all on the road. So it's not like they're museum pieces. Um, yeah, yeah, I just never, I just never sell anything. I, never, <laughs> yeah. I guess it's, uh, that being said, the first collector car I got, I guess would be, well, no, I, back in the very early, early 80s, I bought a, a 54 Jag XK120, which came to me because when I was nine years old, I was riding my bicycle in Balladvale, Massachusetts, and I pedaled up a hill. When I got to the top of the hill, I saw this old guy just pushing out of his garage, you know, holding the steering wheel on the door, just walking with it. A 1951 XK120 Jag with the spats on it. It was gunmetal gray. Oh, and I stared at the thing. I was, oh, look at that thing. Oh, man, you know. And he said, you want to take a look? Come on over here. And I went over. He said, you want to sit in it? He let me sit in it. This, this was the days before all men were pedophiles. You know, he was just a nice guy. <laughs> he let me sit in the car. And You'd never do I, it now. <laughs> no, no. But that image was burned in my mind, you know. And so the first car I got was a 54 Jag XK120. And here's the funny part. I, I told this story once on the Tonight Show, one of the, one, one of the shows, it just it came up, we we're talking cars. And I got a call from this guy in San Francisco. He says, hey, remember that guy that let you sit in his car, Mulligan was his name? I said, yeah, that was the guy's name. He still got the car. I goes, he did. I said, but he, he must be over 100 now. And I thought the guy was like 50. He was 24 when I was nine. But when you're nine, <laughs> 24 might as well be 50. Right. You know? Or 100. <laughs> so when I saw him, he was like 81. Wow. And, oh, so I went back to visit him, and the car was still there in the barn. Uh, and because of Massachusetts, you know, this is a guy. This guy was unbelievable. He was an Eagle Scout as a young man. And he, he heated his house in New England with wood. He would chop cords of wood all summer by himself stack the wood and then burn it all winter you know and he had an old barn that was uh the barn was built in like 1680 or something like that so there were old bottles and the dirt floor and all kinds of stuff but the, the jag was still there and he still had it so that was that was pretty cool you talk about your garage you say it's the more money than brains club yeah that's probably true yeah that's probably true. <laughs> you've got steam electric trucks race cars supercars military vehicles you said once you buy the story as much as you buy the car. Yeah, the story is, is usually what you wind up buying. Uh, I mean, the classic example of that was I've got a 67 Chrysler Imperial, LeBaron Coupe or Coupe, whatever they call it, this dude, with the dual air conditioning. You know? It's not really my kind of car, but I, I get a call. And say, Jay my name is Pumpkin. P Pumpkin was his name. And he was like 93 years old. He said, I can't drive anymore, but I've got a 67 Chrysler Imperial. I bought brand new. I want to sell it to you. And I said, well, all right. Well, how much you want for it? I want $16,000. And I, that was a lot of money. But I said, well, I don't know. I said, well, I'm not really looking. To, uh, you know, I was just trying to kind of hem and haw. He goes, no, you got to see it. I'm a one owner car. He said, I've had it serviced by a guy from Chrysler who would come to my house every month to service the car, to check it out. I, I said, well, that sounds interesting. I said, where do you live? Sunset Boulevard, Beverly Hills. I go, oh, he's like two miles from my house. I go, all right, what's the number? I'm hoping it would be like San Francisco, or someplace where I couldn't get to. Right. I said, well, I'll, drive, I'll, I'll drive down there. So I, I drive down and, you know, I hit the gate and the gate opens, you know, just like the movie Sunset Boulevard. You know, I, as I pull up, I see him. He's got a smoking jacket and an ascot. and He's got the white hair. He's got another white hair guy with me. Jay, this is my mechanic from Chrysler. He wants to retire. He's 72 years old now. Uh, I said, let's take a look at the car. He goes, uh, get, bring the car on the ground. Let me show you around the house. So he, he takes me into this house. And he was a movie producer. And he made African-American films for African-American audiences. And he had the Black James Bond and the Black Gene Autry. And these were real movies. They weren't just, you know, step and fetch a comedy thing. I mean, serious films for when... Back in the days when you know theaters were segregated, that kind of thing, and he was, and he, and he paid them well, and he, you know it was wasn't some horrible thing. Uh, it, they were his actors, and he, he still, he would, and his house looked like a brand new 1948 house inside, you know, with all, all kind of furniture and old lamps and everything. 
And then we're in the living room and I see a picture of this beautiful woman. I go, who's that? Oh, that's my wife. I said, well, she's very beautiful. He says, you want to meet her? I said, yeah, sure. So we go to the bedroom <laughs> door. He knocks on the bedroom door. She goes, hello, who is it? It's, it's me, honey. I got Jay Leno here. He wants to say hello. She goes, well, I, I can't come out right now. And then he says to me, she doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> Yeah, because the picture looked like she was 19. This had to be the 40. And I said, oh, okay. I said, well, I'll catch you next. I'll oh, see you later, Jay. Okay, fine. Okay. So then we go outside, and now the car is out in the garage. And it's beautiful. It's a two-door coupe, just like the one Mr. Drysdale drove in the Beverly Hillbillies. So same color and everything, you know. So he's telling me about the car. And then he says, now, if you buy the car, you got to take all this other crap. And he opens the two doors next to it, and he's got spare bumpers spare fenders extra windshield wiper he bought everything he needed in case the car was ever damaged <laughs> well, okay well now i have to buy this car right you know so i, I have to buy this so <laughs> i bought it, it, it i still hurts and it. all <laughs> and one hundred and forty-four thousand miles on it runs like a top you put the dual air conditioners in it, it actually snows in this car <laughs> The air blows in the back of the front. I mean, you're freezing in seconds. I mean, it's the complete absence of road feel. And, it, and it's a great car. And it was just such a fun story. You know, those, those kind of things are interesting. You're, you have another storied vehicle in your collection, the Duesenberg, that had two previous owners, 1928, that had a heck of a story around it, too. Well, Tell every, me about the, the story that came from the GI. Well, every Duesenberg has a story. Yeah. Uh, my Duesenberg, I, I, I've got a LeBaron barrel side, and it's the first, uh, it sounds silly, the first Duesenberg I bought, but it was. And uh, what happened was, well, I, I, before I get to that, the original owner was a guy named William Ashton. He got the car when he was 17 years old. His grandfather uh, had a bunch of stock, and he gave it to his grandson. And he and the grandfather cashed the stock in, went down and bought this Duesenberg in 1929 for $17,000. When they drove it home, the kid's father, the grandfather's son, just hit the roof, threw them both out of the house. You idiots, you threw your money away. Well, two months later, the stock market crashed. The stock was useless, but he had the car. And he had the car up until the late 40s. Then what happened was uh, the car got sold to a gentleman who was one of the first GIs into Berlin. And he and his troop of guys raided a bunch of the safety deposit box, cracked them open, took the diamonds, the jewels, da, 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 bought an old motorcycle, hid all the diamonds and jewels in the frame of the motorcycle, sealed it up, left it in Germany. Then two years later, they went to Germany as tourists. Oh, and bought a motorcycle, brought it back, cut the frame out, dumped the diamonds out, and bought a huge estate in Connecticut and then bought the Duesenberg. Then this guy got despondent over a woman, drove the Duesenberg into the garage, shut the door, let it run, and asphyxiated himself. Mm. And now the car sat from 1950 about to about 1988, still untouched with only 42,000 miles on it. And his brother owned the car, but his brother would not sell the car to anyone who knew the story, because Duesenberg, like, hey, I'm sorry to hear about your brother killing himself in the car. We want to buy it. No, no, he wouldn't sell it. So I'm at a car show and I'm walking around. I see this old guy and I start talking to him. He mentions Duesenberg. I knew some Duesenberg facts and he seemed impressed with that. He said, would you ever want to buy one? I said, I'd love to buy Duesenberg. You can't find them though. He goes, I've got one for sale. I'm thinking, all right. So I, I bought it from him, never knowing the story. It wasn't until years later that I found out. Wow. But you know, the funny thing was the car had been sitting since 1948 until 1988. So obviously took it back. I gave that one to, we didn't do that. We gave that to Randy E. May. He's one of the premier Duesenberg stores. So now the car is perfect. It's Pebble Beach. We won Pebble Beach, the class with it. And, all. and Nick, the guy I got it from, I bring him out to go for a ride. In it. And he says, uh, step on the brakes. Uh, you know, step on these car stops. Stuff's good. Because, you know, I, I, I did those brakes before I put it in the garage. I go, really? <laughs> really? I mean, I didn't have the heart to tell him. <laughs> Like, oh, well, I said, well, you did a good job because it's stuff. He goes, yeah, oh, yeah. We, we bled them and we made sure that, oh, well, good. <laughs> I mean, we we had every piece off that car. Every Tore that thing apart. Yeah, but it was just, it just, yeah. just funny, yeah. yeah. 
I want to talk about a few of your cars because these are just remarkable in so many ways. The 1906 Advanced Steam Traction Engine, the 1909 Baker Electric, the 81 DeLorean DMC. I don't DeLorean, have a, DMC 12. I don't have a DeLorean, actually. Oh, you don't have a DeLorean? Oh, no. You know, the, sometimes uh, these websites, I will say at the beginning, this car does not belong to me. It belongs to this guy. And it, 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 and then somehow they always think that I own it. No, I'm not a DeLorean guy. You know something? I, I was one of those kids, one of those disillusioned kids by John DeLorean, because when I was an impressionable 13, 14 years old, uh, the GTO came out. And that was John DeLorean's baby, and he had done the Banshee, and he's the guy that made Pontiac, not an old man's car anymore, but an exciting car with the wide track and all that guy, and a great engineer. So he was sort of a hero of mine. And then when he was going to start his own car company, he was like, ah, he's sticking into GM, you know, he's the rebel, you know, all that kind of 60s stuff. Uh, and then, of course, he just turned out to be another sleazy Coke dealer, you know, <laughs> and that, you know, that's that that was such a huge disappointment to me. It, it just it it just marred everything he ever did because uh you know when you're a kid you just sort of have your heroes and when you you, you see your heroes do something like this it's not a, you're not even selling coke to feed your family you know it's not like <laughs> okay my kid's an operation i'm selling some drugs you know i mean it was just pure greed he could have financed his farm or something if he wanted to and it was you know and and then when i saw the movie which things were even worse than that in there. And I went, oh boy, not a good guy. And it really does. It really was disillusioning. You know? Why Why certain models? What's the criteria for buying certain models? Or I like something, anything that was ahead of its time, in its time, anything that was a noble failure. For example, I have one of John DeLorean's noble failures. I have a 68 Pontiac Firebird Sprint. Now hmm. the Sprint features the six cylinder overhead cam engine. Now, John DeLorean was enamored uh, at the time with the XKE. He wanted to build an American XKE. So they took a Chevy six-cylinder, they put an overhead cam on it. It was the first, at least in America, uh, rubber belt drive system rather than a chain for silence and all that kind of stuff. And they made a high-performance model with a quadrajet on it and headers and all this kind of, it was about 225 horsepower. The trouble is when you built the six up to be the high-performance model, it was more money than the V8. And back, especially in the 60s, why would you buy a six when you can get a V8? It just made no sense to anybody. So they didn't sell very many of them. And they managed to find one and we, we just restored it, uh, well, about a year and a half ago. And it's a wonderful car. It's light, it handles. I, I did a lot of Hotchkiss suspension on it. He makes a wonderful update kit. We put Willwood forward this brakes. It all looks stock, it's got the hood tack and all those cool little touches on it. But uh, that was a noble failure. When I opened the hood and people go, what engine is that? Even Pontiac guys that are, especially ones that are under 40 go, what, did you make this up? No, I didn't make it up. It's, it says Pontiac Motor Corporation right on the valve cover, hmm. PM, you know, and they're stunned. They never heard of this engine. And it, it's just interesting. And I like it because it's a car about handling, not about power. You can use all the power all the time. Just take it to red line every second. And you're never going to overpower the chassis like you would if you had a big 400 cubic inch in there or something. So it, 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 it's sort of fun. Same thing with Duesenbergs. Duesenbergs were noble failures. It was a better, faster car than it ever needed to be back in the day. I mean, but the speed limit was 45 miles an hour. This is a car that could go, well, 120 easy. And the supercharged one could go 130, you know. So it wasn't until the Chrysler Hemi of the early 50s came out that there was an engine more powerful than the Duesenberg. You have an F1 McLaren as well yeah. as a, as well as a P1. Yeah, that, that incredibly was, rare. You know what's so funny? That was one of those cars when it came out. Gordon Murray is the most brilliant engineer with, with terrible timing because he always seems to come out with things when there's a recession, you know? And, and when the uh, McLaren came out, the Vector had come out right before it. That was a failure. The 220 Jag, which is supposed to be a V12 with a six speed, but, but it wound up being a V6 with a five speed. Was, and the, there were just disappointment after disappointment. And those cars back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
All of a sudden, McLaren comes along with a car that was close to a million dollars. And people thought, well, I mean, these two are kind of crappy cars at 200, 300,000. Really, a million dollars? I mean, it, it, it was so outlandish at the time. People just said, well, this is crazy. Uh, they had originally, uh, originally hoped to build 300 cars. They got 64 road cars, and they just stopped production. Then, once they got in the hands of road testers, people went, oh, my God, this is the greatest car of the 20th century. The accolades came, and then the cars started to go up in value. That's when I got interested. I thought, oh, I started reading about them because I was like everyone else is at a million, 800,000. That's crazy. And then I started reading these road tests. So I called my client and I go, how many second hands? Well, we have one here. It uh, has uh, 1,500 miles on it, car number 15. Um, I said, how much is it? He goes, 800. I said, that's what they cost new. He goes, we think they're going to go up in value. I said, well, I don't know. Um, uh, you know, I had the devil on the shoulder and then the, the angel on the other side. I said to him, look, I'll call you back in two weeks. If it hasn't been sold by then, I'll buy it. So I'm telling people this, and most people say, you're crazy to spend that on the car. It's the most ridiculous thing. So the two weeks go by, and I call him, the car still like, I goes, yeah, we still got it. I went, but well, we have some interest today. I said, this sounds like the oldest con. I, but I said, the, 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 all right, I'll buy it. You know, because, you know, buying a car is a rational purchase, a rational purchase done irrationally. You know, you don't yeah. need it. But I said, OK, I'll buy it. So I, I, I bought it. Here's the funny thing about me buying a client. I bought them a client F1. It doesn't get more British than this. I said, it has air conditioning. Yeah, it's got air conditioning as standard. I said, oh, OK, good. But if you want good air conditioning, it's 25000 extra. I said, OK, so what does that mean? What's, what's bad air conditioning? Well, in England, it's cold and rainy all the time. So the air conditioner is fine. In California, where it's 80 or 90 degrees, and he said, well, we had a couple more vents in the cabin and a few other. I said, oh, yeah, all right, give me the good, give me the good air. <laughs> For 25 grand. And it still does. It's still like, <laughs> it's still not very good air conditioning. But that's OK. That's beside the point. Anyway, so I bought this car for $800,000. Then the funny thing, there's only 64 in the world. So uh, I fly it over here. You know, I go to England first to look at it. OK, so I have it flown over. I go to the airport. I'm driving home from the airport. I come up my street, and I see another one parked in the house three doors down from me. I go, what? What? Two, so two I, of <laughs> 60. So I and I knock on the door. And like a movie, this like supermodel, like, kind of in a bathrobe towel. Yes, can I help you? I went, oh, I'm sorry to bother you. Um, whose car? That's my boyfriend's car. That's Dan's car. I said, oh, is is he here? And, and she looked insulted. What the, what, oh, is she, I'm asking about the car. I go, no, I, I, I live up the street. And see, these are very rare cars. I have a one, two. And she's looking at me like, what? Like I'm crazy. Really? So you have the same car? Really? So what? And I said, well, anyway, just have him call me. So he calls me. OK. And we become friends. And then he calls me about a year later. He goes, I got offered me a million twenty-five for mine. I'm dumping it. But we're not going to see that again. This guy oh. really wants it. I go, don't sell it. He goes, no, no. I only paid, you know, I think he paid seven fifty or something, eight hundred. Uh, I'm going to make two hundred fifty thousand on. I don't know. I got to. I don't know if this opportunity come up. Well, of course. Then they've just gone crazy. Since yeah, they're then. now worth know, about twelve like, million. Oh no! Last offer I got was seventeen five. Oh, there we go. And one one sold at uh, at Monterey a year or two ago, a private sale of twenty four. Oh. but I think that was a GDR. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. You have no Ferraris. Why? You know, I like Ferraris. They're excellent cars. I really, I just drove the FF ninety. I just never like dealing with the dealers. I don't want to give a guy 25 grand in an envelope. Uh, <laughs> you know. yeah, I don't want to have to buy two Mondials. To, you know something? The smart thing about McLaren is the dealer service. Uh, I bought my McLaren. I paid exactly the sticker. Buying it was a terrific process. I had the car six or seven months, my MP412C. And they called me one day and they said, oh, there's an upgrade from uh, 500 and uh, 
92 horsepower, I think it is, to 617. You want the upgrade? I said, well, how much is it? And they said, it's free. Just come on in. Wow. Oh, okay. I brought it in. And like when I bought it, I said, I want to order the carbon fiber brakes. And the sales guy said, do you track the car? I go, no, I'm mostly street. He goes, don't get the carbon fiber. You save 20 grand. You don't need it. I said, you sure? He goes, guarantee it. In fact, he said the, the steel brakes are better on the street because they, they work right away. You don't have to get them hot, blah, blah. And fine, it saved me twenty thousand dollars. When I bought my Porsche Carrera GT, Porsche brought it here in a flatbed. They sent two mechanics to show me here's how you jack it up. Here are the jacking points. Here you put these blocks in. Here you go. Here's how you do this. Uh, it, you know, they sent me a jacket. Here's a book on the car. Here's a pen and pencil set. You know, until the car showed up, I felt like a customer. So I, I just never. I, I you mean, didn't want the honor of having to own a Ferrari. Yeah, you know. I, I, you know, it's like rich guys that go to dominatrix. Oh, she kicked the crap out of me. It was fantastic. <laughs> it was great. I mean, some guys like that. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, and, and they're excellent cars. I, this is not an indictment of a car. It's just that yeah. I don't want to, you know, you're spending a tremendous amount of money. You should be made to feel like a customer. I don't want to be told, well, you must buy two Mondials before you can buy this year. You have to buy two crappy cars before. I, yes. Uh, well, then, you know, can I just buy the car, you know, and then the idea that I have it for two years, then I take it back to get a certificate to prove that it's actually a Ferrari. That's 25. I, it, it, I just get tired of that. Yeah. I won't ask you the obvious question, but I will ask you the question in this way. The obvious one. Go ahead. Well, the obvious one is, of course, the favorite. So let's not do that. I, I want to ask you which one you would save from a disaster. Oh, wow. Ah. Well, I guess the F1 McLaren, yeah. you know, um, you know, the funny part is out of all those that are behind you, all of those in the garage where you're sitting right now. Well, here's the interesting thing. These are made of metal and metal breaks, whereas electronics degrade, you get a modern car. And uh, I mean, a modern car that's been in a flood, forget it. There's nothing you can do. Uh, one of these, you could pull them out from the bottom of the sea, dry it off, and get it to run. You know, uh, that's the fun part about it. Um, if, you know, I think John Travolta had a movie called uh, Destination Earth or something a couple of years ago. Well, about 15 years ago. It wasn't a very good movie, but it takes place in the future. And they're in a mountain and in a cave, they find an old jet plane, they get in, they turn the key, go, it starts, let's go. And they take off. And it just, it just made me laugh how much preparation, you know, old cars can sit for, for, I, I've got a model, a guy gave me a, a 15 model T. He had it behind his house for 22 years. And we dragged it here, the tires are flat, gas tanks all rotted. We put like, like this, we put some gasoline and a thing uh, gravity fed it into the carburetor. I pulled the handle three times and it fired with no battery off the mag and it fired and it ran. I mean, it ran rough and obviously, but I, yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah. So to me, the old stuff, you can take a lot more of a beating than modern stuff, modern stuff, you know, when, when a lot electronic go, you can't look at it and go, oh, I see the problem now, you know? Yeah. Johnny Carson, um, he left you a special car and it, it sits in one corner of your garage and Johnny took it to his prom and he left it to you in his will. Yeah. Johnny bought Johnny's dad bought it in 1939. It's a Chrysler Royal. And I've got film of Johnny polishing it when he was 12 and then taking it to his prom when he was 18. And there was a special in 1982 called Johnny goes home where Johnny comes home and NBC searched all around Norfolk, Nebraska, to try and find a 39 Chrysler Royal. And they found one. And it turned out it was Johnny's dad. The guy had bought it from Johnny's dad and he restored it. So they bought it for $15,000, which seemed like a ridiculous amount of money at the time because they had NBC over a barrel. And they gave it to Johnny as a gift. And Johnny liked it because it was his dad, but he wasn't a real car guy. I mean, he drove it a little bit, but kind of parked it. And I told them, you know, you should donate it to the Imperial Palace. They have a great, and they set up a whole Johnny Carson exhibit with, da -na -da -da -na, you know, tapes of the show and pictures of Johnny driving it when he's 12 and 14 and whatnot. And, but he, unbeknownst to me, he left a note in there saying, when you're through exhibiting it, 
please give it to Jay Leno. And wow. So, so yeah, that, yeah, I was deeply touched by that. Must have been touched. Yeah, must have been very touching. Yeah, I, I, it's a great car. It's not here right now. I just sent it to Nebraska. To they opened the Johnny Carson Museum. Okay. In town, and so they have it on display there. Did you ever take Johnny through your garage? No. Okay. No. He did. He didn't but, care much about. Well, you, to me, it's you know I grew up back east where you call people by their Mr. Carson. Like I'd be on with Johnny, I go, "No, oh, Mr. Carson, it's Johnny." And I, you know, to me, he was he was Johnny Carson. You know, like you know, I started doing Letterman. I go, "Hey, Letterman, nice tie," and I could make fun of him and you know and trash him, and he could trash me. And with Johnny, it was always, "Oh my, it's Johnny Carson." You know, so I was always very respectful. So I never. Hey, Johnny, why don't you come by the garage? I mean, it wasn't that kind of thing. We went out to dinner a couple of times and that type of thing, but uh, he wasn't uh, that, that kind of guy. You do a ton of restorations in the garage, yeah. which most people probably don't know. And in fact, even uh, I, I had heard a 3D printing uh, on an intake manifold for a car once. <laughs> well, yeah, we made it an intake manifold for a 27-liter 27, uh, 27 Merlin so we could run it on Weber's. And... Uh, it works fantastic. You know, that's the future because there are no junkyards anymore. You're not going to find parts for a 1909 steam car. I have a car called a Premier, a 1914 Premier built in Indianapolis. Huge six-cylinder car, big, strong six-cylinder car. And the guy I got it from bought it in 73, but the water pump was completely corroded. So he figured he'd go to a junkyard and find one. He never found one. So I bought it from him for what he paid for it in 73, like 15, 20 years ago. And we took the old water pump, we scanned it with a ferro arm from a 3D scanner, we used Stratus and scanned it, added more metal where it had corroded and printed up a brand new water pump with the same numbers on it that were on the old one from scanning it. You do it in plastic, you make it 1% bigger for shrink it and then use that. Well, now you can make, you can 3D print in metal with powdered metal. And it's, it's, wow. it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty long amazing. ways from wrenching at that garage back in, uh, yeah, <laughs> on the East it, coast. It's pretty amazing. I love when the old Bridgeport lathe guys come by and they see 3d printing and they go, what? It, and it comes out complete. Not even like you have to assemble it. You could, you can just scan the whole thing and make a working piece. What's your daily drive, Jay? I mean, I know you drive everything, but when, what, what do you, what do you take to oh, go to the grocery store? You know, I just bought a Tesla plant. Yeah, you just set a record with that. I mean, oh you were God. you were that, recorded setting a world record. That thing is unbelievable. I mean, we did one pair. Went to Formosa Drag Strip in Bakersfield. Had the NHRA guys there, so it's certified. Uh, drove to the strip, lined up under the lights, air conditioner on, four door, nail it, light change green, go. And we did uh, 9.247 and 152 miles an hour. I mean, it is the fastest accelerating vehicle you can buy now. World I acceleration mean, record for a quarter mile. Yeah, um, and Remac, they're building a car, but theirs is 1.8 million or something. And that, I'm not even sure if it's certified yet. But for now, the Tesla Plaid, you know, there's no maintenance. It's pretty bulletproof. You got just about a 400 mile range. It's a pretty amazing vehicle. I, 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 I'm stunned at how good it is. I mean, I love the fact that it's built in America, American labor, American technology. You know. Did Elon reach out to you after that? Well, I've known Elon a long time. He came here in 2007 with the Roadster. And right. at, the time, at the time, the thinking of, golf, of electric cars, is they're just golf carts that maybe have a little more power, but this thing was fast. And he told me, he said, oh, I'm going to be build, building charging stations all around the country so you get free charging. I'm like, yeah, okay, that'll work. You know, I mean, that really is a visionary because even to this day, everybody that builds an electric car, you go, where are you going to charge? Oh, you can charge it anywhere. Well, not really. You know, if you live in an apartment or a townhouse, you're not going to charge it anywhere. Um, you know, most people don't have the facilities to charge an electric car. I mean, I know it's a, you have to have a guy come in and set up a 220 special. Uh, socket and all that kind of thing for you. But, um, well, it's really no more difficult than putting a washer dryer in, but it still requires an electrician. Uh, yet he set up these charging stations as he was developing the car, having no idea whether it'd be successful or not. And uh, so it, 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 it's pretty amazing. When you look at, you know, it's so funny. I'm talking to the Tesla guys about their new 
carbon rotors for their, and I felt like my mother when she came in the garage and the guys are talking about cam timing. Can I get you boys a drink? <laughs> no, it's all ohms and amperage and volts. And I'm going, I have no idea. But right. I, Those are even harder to wrench on, aren't they? <laughs> I know, I'm, but I'm trying to learn. Yeah. But the idea is that you have no maintenance. Of any, I mean, I had a 2015 Tesla Model S with the ludicrous mode. Never been to a dealer, never had any kind of service done. I had it for almost seven years. <sighs> Amazing. Yeah. What's your day-to-day -day like these days? I know uh, Jay Leno's Garage has been hugely popular. You're... Um, oh. You filmed Jalen's Grad and I, I'm starting this game show, You Bet Your Life. It's the old Groucho show. Yeah. Uh, we're doing that. And uh, I was doing Tim Allen. There's another great car guy. Tim is a, and he's Mr. Detroit. You know, he's from Detroit. So he has a great love of American muscle and American auto engineering and stuff. And well, and, and so do I. You know, I, I, I'm always amazed at this, you know, this reputation that we earned in the 70s and early 80s for sloppy construction really takes a long time to go away. You know, in the late 40s, Cadillac was the best car in the world. It had power steering, power brakes, hydraulic windows, hydraulic top if you got a convertible. You could even get air conditioning in by 52 or 53. Rolls-Royce was still a stick shift with a six cylinder flathead. I mean, it was, you know, it was the envy of the world. And then we started building these crappy cars in the 70s and 80s when then the Japanese came in and kind of had our lunch. But now we're back. I mean, I love the new trimmed down General Motors and Ford. And I love the fact, you know, like everybody else, I thought for sure the C7 would be the base Corvette and then the C8 would be 150 or 200. To come out with a car like that for 60 some odd. Th and I know guys that paid 62,000, 63 or 68 out the door amazing and then you know, I thought, a beautiful vehicle i know and i thought well it's going to have some sort of torque converted no dual clutch transmission a lot of magnesium in the frame and aluminum in the chassis i mean a world-class supercar for a third of the price i mean i i think you can run with hurricanes and mclarens and everything else uh they might have a slight edge but i think once the new uh z06 model comes out it'll that'll change too, but a very impressive car for the money. And the Mustang, same thing. A Mustang is a real sports car now. I've got one of the uh, 2015 uh, 350Rs. And, uh, you know, it was to celebrate the 50th anniversary. They built 37 uh, R Mustangs in 65. And so they built 37 and 15, and I've got uh, number 36. And what a great car that is with that uh, flat plane crank. I mean, an American V8 that revs to 8,400 RPM, it's basically almost a Ferrari V8, except it revs higher, and it's 13 pounds lighter. I mean, it's, it's, it's just an amazing car, independent suspension, handles well, and it's American. I love that. Do you miss being out on the road doing comedy? Oh, sure I do. Yeah, 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 I do miss it. Um, uh, I was lucky, you know, when the pandemic hit, I was pretty established already. All right, so I've got enough squirreled away. Okay, I can sit home and, you know, I just feel sorry for young performers who, you can't even work as a waiter or waitress anymore because there's no job. It's, it, restaurants are closed, and now that it's coming back again. I mean, starting uh, now, we've got to wear a mask again in California. So, who knows where it's going to go? But uh, no, I do miss it tremendously. But uh, I can't be greedy and say no. I want more. I certainly had my time and I enjoyed it. And I, I'm still on the road a little bit, but it's just not as much, just different. You're a comedian who has entered into the Automotive Hall of Fame. Just really want to congratulate you on that. And maybe I'm the first comedian in the Hall of Fame. You, I think you are the first comedian in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> I have to see if, if uh, Harold Wills is in there. He's one of my favorites. You know who he is? You ever hear the Will St. Clair car? No, I haven't. Harold Wills was uh, Henry Ford's first employee. Ford split everything with him 50-50. A lot of people don't know that. Ford was not cheap. He was generous, but he didn't like to give credit. So Wills was responsible for Vanadium Steel and the planetary transmission. He developed the Ford logo with uh, the blue oval, which is wow. still to this day. Wow. And he and Henry Ford were partners. And, you know, like everybody else, Henry Ford wanted to build a people's car, and he wanted to build. And there's 
you know, they, so they threw rocks at each other. So he took his millions of dollars in stock in about, uh, I guess, 13, 14, he left and he started the Will St. Clair car company. Uh, he built a 265 cubic inch overhead cam V8, bevel drive to overhead cams, no belts, everything's done internally. Uh, I mean, it's the most brilliant little V8 engine. And he showed it to Henry Ford. He was best man at uh, Henry Ford's wedding, or Henry Ford was best man at his wedding, as it was. And um, Henry Ford said, nobody wants to go 70 miles an hour. Hmm. You know, and it was a classic case of everything was inside. It looked like, a, it just looked like a bigger version of a, a Ford coupe. But when you open the hood, he, to this day when I open the people go, oh, this isn't the engine that came in it. Yeah, it is. They had that in 1920, a V8 with overhead cam. Oh, yeah, they wow. did. And it, it's really interesting. Ahead of his time. Yeah, and but he started a, a, a factory in Marysville, and uh, he, uh, you know, he did what kind of the Bernie Sanders thing. If you work for him, you didn't pay any rent, and if you got laid off, you could live in the house rent-free and your, your health care, and, and eventually... He sold 12,000 cars, but when a recession came and that dipped a little bit, the whole thing imploded, and that was the end of it. He was a nice man and a decent guy and a brilliant engineer. I think he also invented the seal beam headlight and a few other things. He worked for Chrysler and uh, just an interesting guy. I think I'm sure I'm, I have to check. I'm sure he's in the Hall of Fame. I gotta well, say. if he isn't, we will put a case for him yeah, together. Well, yeah, yeah, let me know. <laughs> Jay Leno, thank you so much for being on the thank program. You. Thanks a for pleasure. having me. On. Congratulations. Thanks. The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world in America. The rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio.